Good day, medical nemesis. I have a quick announcement before we begin our awesome interview with Ron Robertson of Picmonic. If you haven't yet checked out Physiology by Physio, I wanted to again recommend this for first-year students especially. Hosted by ITB's very own Greg Rodden, they cover in-depth physiology topics. You may notice a lot of names being thrown at you, such as free med ed, med school phys, physio, and of course inside the boards. That's because we believe in the power of cooperation and that you can accomplish more together. If you would like to join the collaboration, either as a content creator or as a supporter, please visit our new community forum. Go to our bit.ly link at bit.ly slash ITB Slack to join our discussion community. Here you can chat with the hosts of all of the podcasts within the ITB network, share study strategies and resources, and make requests for changes to any of our products, even the ITB Audio Bank phone app. Again, that's bit.ly slash ITB Slack to join our Slack community, available on mobile and desktop. And now, on with today's show. Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. When trying to create visual mnemonics for medicine, there are a few places that students can turn to for comprehensive examples. But one of these places that needs no introduction is Picmonic. Since 2011, Picmonic has been bringing graphic representations of educational-related mnemonics to a variety of healthcare fields. Today, we have Ron Robertson, the co-founder and CEO of Picmonic, here to help us guide us through creating our medical mnemonics. Rob, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. So just a brief introduction for the audience. What got you into these visual mnemonics and creating this educational material through Picmonic? Well, I think what we'd have to do is kind of step back in time and take a take a little journey through my personal kind of academic career. So to give context, you know, I went to the University of San Diego in undergrad and studied uh, biochemistry. And while I was there, I'd always known that I wanted to go into medical school, but uh, knew that I also needed to find ways to supplement my uh, GPA and one of those being through research. And so I had an opportunity to study under a neuroscientist, specifically analyzing how memory is stored in the brain. So doing some research on neuro. And I was always fascinated by the brain and how it works. And, you know, despite our limited understanding, I think it was kind of a basis for me to really start to understand how memory works. Yet, I've always kind of felt like I personally had a terrible memory. And so when I was in medical school, then fast forward a couple of years, I went to the University of Arizona. I started in 2009. And, you know, after your, what, second year of med school, you take the boards. And while I was studying for uh, step one, that I kind of had this freak out moment that it was like, damn, I don't remember so much of what I learned over the previous two years. This is going to be a problem. I'm not going to pass step or I'm going to do poorly. I'm not, not going to get into the residency that I want. And ultimately, I'm not going to become a, a competent healthcare practitioner. So I really freaked out a little bit. And that's when I started leaning on visual mnemonics. Now, why visual mnemonics? And where did this really fit in? You know, I'd say at that point in time in medical school, there was very few resources or supplementary tools out there that leveraged mnemonics, maybe some acronyms, right? Kind of throughout first aid. Yeah, most are acronyms, not my favorite form of mnemonic. No, and, and even with them, it's so easy, you know, so an acronym taking the first letter of multiple words, stringing them together to form kind of a new, a new word. It really easy to forget what a specific letter represents. And so even beyond that, though, there weren't acronyms for everything. And when it came to pharmacology or the micro or even, you know, certain biochemical diseases, that was a, for me, just a, a point of massive struggle. And so out of that, just out of sheer necessity, while I was studying for step one, I started to create my own versions of picture mnemonics, essentially coming up with these silly stories and taking the medical terminology and the medical words and converting them into phonetic based characters. And then these characters tied together into concepts. And I was fortunate because I'm 
not artistic in the least, but I had a buddy, Johnny Antoni at the time, who was doing tattoo art. And so he actually would draw these illustrations for me. And what it was, was this idea, right? Like, let's say Neiman Pick disease, you would turn Neiman Pick into the man with the pick in his knee. And Neiman Pick disease is caused by deficiency in an enzyme known as sphingomyelinase. And so you'd think about a sphinx on my leg, sphingomyelinase, sphinx on my leg, right? Just turning individual words into these characters that were then tied together into these overall concepts. And very, very quickly, this went from me struggling to remember these concepts to just having them locked in. And then after I took step that, uh, you know, a week later started Picmonic. So kind of fast forwarding from undergrad to grad school and struggling and trying to, to solve some of the frustrations and problems I was having in a way that worked for me. And then really kind of leaned into the idea, how do we make this available for other students? Yeah, I can understand that struggle. I am going through a lot of it myself too. And you're so right. And a lot of students feel the same way that by the time you get to your step one material, it is really hard to remember some of the things you learned almost two years ago, unless you've constantly been refreshing and using different types of space, repetition, rehearsal practice. Even then, there are way too many details for you to remember everything. So it's interesting to see that you took this what seems to be an earlier direction towards visual mnemonics when it really didn't seem to exist too much back then. Yeah, I think at that point in time, if we're speaking about what, 2011, there was a book that had black and white uh, kind of visual mnemonics called, I think it was Micro Made Ridiculously Simple or something like that. But it was oh, yeah. it was pretty bare bones. And so right around the same time, Picmonic actually started in 2011. We launched our first product in 2013. And, you know, it's essentially two medical students and brothers based out of Arizona. And then around the same time, you had Sketchy started out of California with a couple of medical students. And it was, you know, I think the in the grand scheme of things, just a lot of us were struggling and frustrated by the lack of resources available, despite the fact that this type of learning methodology is very, very, very powerful. It definitely is. I I know we had the guys from Sketchy on too, the brothers, and it was interesting to hear their point of view from being, I guess, more naturally artistic, which I'm not. And I guess you kind of feel the same (laughs) way. (laughs) Like if I can draw a good uh, stick figure, that's pretty impressive. So trying to come up with these visuals can be very difficult. So I I was curious to hear their story from an artistic point of view, but then now seeing how you utilize the same type of verbal techniques that I've heard a lot about and we've spoken about on past episodes, but having them actually drawn out by a tattoo artist, that's uh, that's unique. I haven't heard that before. Again, I think it was in a sense opportunistic. I was just really creating these stories in my in my mind's eye, right? Coming up with them in my head and visualizing them, but I didn't have the ability to draw. And yet when I started sharing them and and they were put to you know, put pen to paper and turned into these phenomenal illustrations, it became just imprinted in in my brain. And it was like, well, I'm never going to forget that. Yeah, I can see how easy it would be to remember a multitude of facts with that that visual aid that you can always go back and review. Actually, that is a, a great question. What do you use for your review? Do you keep a journal of your written visuals, such as, for example, I in the past have written them out verbally since I couldn't draw them out as I imagine them and then use that journal to review them later on? Well, you know, I don't, I think I use this type of visual mnemonic methodology different in my everyday life now than I did when I was a student. And as a student, you know, fortunately in today's time, there's many resources available where students can leverage this type of learning methodology in, you know, concert with so many other resources that are pretty phenomenal and significantly evolved since I was in medical school, which really, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, only seven, eight years, but, uh, but there's so many tools available today to help students learn more efficiently, lock in the contents, you know, practice along their journey, ensuring that they become more successful, not just on exams, but, but in their practice. Very true. I learn more with every interview that I've done on this show, all the learning experts and memory experts and visual training and just a lot of great tools that students can utilize that they probably have never heard before. The majority haven't heard before in their past education. So great to see that there are resources like Pigmonic out there to get these examples and, and kind of go from there. Yeah, absolutely. 
So what are some strategies that you would recommend for medical students that are trying to make their own visual mnemonics, maybe just starting off? Well, if we're going to say medical students, you know, I would say that between Picmonic and Sketchy, there's a lot of available content out there. And, I, and to be clear, we have the utmost respect for Sketchy. They've got a great product. The, the, the founders are phenomenal. And yet there are some subtle differences between the products that most students aren't aware of. But I would say that, you know, students have a, have, have a chance to leverage existing content that has already been created so that they don't need to make all of these concepts or associations themselves. And I think that's important because as we mentioned earlier, there's so much information and so little time that students constantly feel overwhelmed as is. So the need or the necessity to, to go and create this type of learning material themselves is, is difficult. So I think it's a beautiful thing that these resources do exist in the market and now are widely accepted and adopted. So we should go down the the path of kind of the, the products that exist and I think what uh, maybe some of those differences are. But if we were going to say if they didn't exist, let's say for something outside of healthcare where students had to create from scratch but wanted to leverage the power of visual memory, how do they go about it? Well, I think first off, the idea of turning any single word into a character is very powerful. Penicillin becomes a pencil villain. Warfarin becomes a war fairy. Pneumonia becomes a nude Mona Lisa, right? Every word that otherwise doesn't have a picturable equivalent or a, if you say a word and you can't think of a picture that would represent it naturally, then you can come up with a character for it. And the playing off of phonetics is a very powerful way because if you think about that word or you see that word, you see the character, and it cues in your mind what the word actually is, that's very powerful. So the first step is turning information into characters. And then you tie characters together into concepts. So you can string multiple characters together. And one of the keys here is to do so through interaction and exaggeration. You want to make it larger than life. You want to make it weird and wacky. You want to make it funny. You want to make it inappropriate. You want to tie emotion to these characters in a way that you're going to remember it later. And we remember things that are weird and wacky or funny better than we do things that are boring or mundane. So if I was going to say out of a couple of examples I already used, there's a penicillin, which becomes a pencil villain and warfarin, which becomes a war fairy. If I wanted you to remember that these two things are tied together, I'm going to want you to imagine the pencil villain running away from this little fairy it's got a grenade launcher and is flying after the pencil villain. And right. So interaction and exaggeration and making it larger than life. Those are all tips and tricks that you can use while creating these from scratch. Yeah. Okay. So I, I see some similarities there with certain memory training books that I've read in the past. Is that sort of the, the same type of process that you initially learned about when using these? It is. Awesome. Okay. And a lot of this came from. You know, there's actually been a lot of literature conducted and research around visual mnemonics and memory and, but the majority of it didn't exist for higher academia. And so applying these concepts and methodologies that have existed in literature into medical education was not to say groundbreaking, but, but very different. And, you know, I think over the years, we've not only proven through market adoption, but actually conducted international research board approved studies demonstrating the efficacy of products like Picmona. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I definitely see that uh, it's getting bigger in certain academic fields, but I didn't realize there was so much research being poured into it and showing actual research benefit, clinical benefit or statistical benefit, I should say. But I also, sorry, I didn't mean to cut into your depiction there. Was there another step after going from info into a character, then creating these concepts? And then would there be a third step behind that? Well, the way that we think about it, and not to break um, this apart too much, but once you've created this sort of concept, the idea is obviously, can you then turn it into an actual image? And then if you have the image, how often should you be looking at it, reviewing it, etc.? And so I think, you know, to, to kind of pull back and abstract away from just the visual mnemonic itself, when we're talking about how can students learn more efficiently and effectively, we break it down into kind of a three-step process. And I think it really comes down to learning, quizzing, and spaced review. And I wasn't familiar with even this kind of three-step process when I started medical school. We're not 
necessarily taught how to learn, right? We just are, are thrown overboard into the deep blue and you got to learn how to swim. 100% agree. <laughs> <laughs> so the Picmonic methodology, and I'll, I'll make it, uh, you know, directly apply to kind of our methodology, I'm not saying it's the, the right way to go about it or the only way, but, you know, I think it's very effective and there's an immense amount of literature and science that backs this. And so the general idea is take a difficult concept, something you're struggling to remember and leverage the picture mnemonic for it. So for Picmonic, you're going to play a video. On average, these are going to be two minutes long and it's going to take the high yield information, the information that's difficult to remember and frequently tested. And we're going to turn it into, again, this, these picture mnemonic characters that are animated into this video. You watch a two minute video. What do you do next? After you watch the video, you're going to go and practice active recall, right? So we're going to take away the picture. We're going to take away the cues and we're going to see, do you remember all those little details through a multiple choice quiz? After you've quizzed yourself, now the system is tracking all of that data. And what we're going to do is plug it into a spaced repetition algorithm that's going to prompt you with the right information to review at the right points in time so that you can ensure you're maximizing your retention long-term. Right. So this is when I come in to pick Monarch, I'm going to see this daily quiz and it's going to test me on things that I might have learned three days ago and gotten wrong or that I learned six months ago and got right. But I need to see again in order to not forget it. Right. So kind of this three step process, you're learning, you're quizzing and then you're practicing, you're reviewing based on space repetition algorithms, which are just essentially using increasing intervals in time of previously learned information in order to maximize retention. Okay. So I know a lot of students use Anki for similar spacing of their studies, but I really like the aspect that you just described with the recall rehearsal aspect that forces you to, without priming, without seeing everything there, get the correct information on your own. And that seems to be a very powerful aspect of learning that might have been underappreciated until recent years. I would say yes. And I, I think, you know, I was guilty myself. When I learned something, I would learn it and then I would just reread it and just, you know, kind of brute force repetition. And that's just not the most effective way to go about it. So instead of, you know, after you've learned something, the, the idea is do recall, practice active recall. And by doing this, and I'm talking about quizzing questions, and there's a lot of resources available, but by actually practicing active recall, you're reconsolidating the memory, you know, you're pinpointing areas of weakness. All of these are, are incredibly beneficial in the learning process and yet not what we intuitively do. We like to focus on what we know, not what we don't know. And we like to review things that we've read. And, and you can actually, I'm sure you've heard this before, but you can, there's this, well, we can, we can skip it. But this idea that you become so familiar with a concept or a topic that you can recite it from memory, even though you might not have the true conceptual understanding down. Mm, I have heard that. I can't think of the term though. <laughs> oh, no, I'm blanking on it. So it's poor form. I have a terrible memory. <laughs> See, <laughs> so I so. See, I do too. So I completely understand where you're coming from. And I made every mistake in the book during my studies. So I completely feel the pain there. And that's sort of why I have this podcast is to make sure that the other students out there hopefully don't make the same mistakes. They can be educated through these interviews and uh, resources and save themselves a lot of trouble in the long run. And there's so many resources out there today, which is phenomenal in a sense that, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of actually students from the healthcare disciplines have branched out and started their own companies, started their own product lines, and ultimately all with similar intent. And that's just that there's lacking resources in the industry that will really help students be more successful. So there's a lot of great tools out there now. And the question for students becomes, well, how do I navigate that? that landscape, right? If there are 30 different resources available and they're all highly recommended, what do I use? When do I use it? And how do I use these things together? And that's an interesting question. Yeah. You will find endless online medical student forums with questions similar to that. And <laughs> there really is no great answer. It's going to be dependent on what you know and where you're trying to go. Absolutely. So one thing we didn't really touch on with the mnemonics training was memory palaces. And I was wondering if you implement those at all in your training, either via the quizzes or teachings or anything like that. In an abstract way, we do. I mean, the you might even be able to explain memory palaces better than I, but uh, 
we try and use different settings to kind of create this place and specific location in order to set a scene of a story for each Picmonic title or topic. And this is kind of playing off the Memory Palace idea. But I would say that it's not been fully implemented or executed, I think, as it probably has the potential to be. But one thing I would note that I've seen that's really, really interesting is within Picmonic, we also have an authoring tool. So for students who want to create their own visual mnemonics, they can actually come to Picmonic and you can create an entire Picmonic from start to finish in a matter of minutes. And what does this mean? Well, you're putting in information and then you're attaching it to these characters and then you can drop in a background and you can record your own audio or you can even just type in a story and it'll narrate it for you. All right. So interesting way to go and create these visual visual study cards yourself. Yet what we've seen, the idea of the memory palace is a lot of times if you have a place in your life that is meaningful to you, you know, you can think of your childhood home or this coffee shop you go to all the time or you know, a job and a specific location that you worked at. Well, if you actually have a picture of those places, you can drop that, you can upload an image directly into the Picmonic and kind of set that as your background, right? So that location becomes the canvas, which then you get to go and place these characters into and create a story that will then help you remember all the little details. And that's, you know, partially tied back to this idea of a memory palace. Yeah, I saw the visual mnemonic generator not too long ago, and unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of time to play around with it, but it looked quite interesting. So I assume if you took maybe panoramic view of a room or something and use that as the background, and then you can drop items throughout the room, because the, the only difference I really see with a more strict memory palace versus some of the scene-based things seen in Picmonic or Sketchy is just where the stations are. So you know where the stations are in a room, you know where the bed is or the cabinets or desk or something like that. So you can visually picture the order of things in a clockwise or counterclockwise manner, whichever way you want to go. Whereas an arbitrary scene, or at least if it's arbitrary to you, if you didn't create it yourself and you're not aware of it, it might be a little more difficult or take a little, a few more repetitions anyway to get it down. That's probably the only difference. And I'm not sure that it's that significant as long as you use the space repetitions accurately. I think you said that all very well, right? So if you have a more personal setting or location that you're familiar with, you know, you know where every little detail is in that room or you've been you've been in that spot a thousand times, much much more familiar for you to then go and kind of hang or attach or pin different things that you want to remember along that physical space. Versus if it's an arbitrary scene or setting, harder, you know, you're, you're almost kind of learning two things and it's not as familiar for you. Exactly. Okay. So I really think that's a, a fun tool that I'm probably going to have to play around with a little bit more. And I'll put the link in the show notes, definitely. But the Picmonic mnemonic generator, is it called? We just call it the Picmonic generator. Okay. But you pick Monic generator. You want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a, a fun free tool for our students to use. Yeah. So to be clear, I mean, you can sign up for Picmonic for free. We have a freemium model, meaning anyone can get in. They can learn one Picmonic every day for free, take up to 20 quiz questions for free every single day, utilize the spaced repetition. And then if they want to subscribe, they can, and that'll get them full content access. So for medical students, we have about 1400 different videos covering around 15,000 facts, right? So one of the big differences of us in Sketchy at this point is I think they have around 400 topics. So we have around 1,400. So we have a lot more actual topics and videos, but they go really in depth and they do a great job teaching every single concept. On average, let's say a video is 15 to 20 minutes long on Sketchy and don't quote me on this, but for Picmonic, we try and keep them two minutes, right? Or less. So we want to just give you the most critical information as quick as possible, but we're not trying to teach in-depth concepts. We know that you're getting getting that information in lectures, you're getting it through pathoma or osmosis or other resources. We want to give you that mental or visual memory anchor so that once you see that image and you review it a couple times with spaced repetition, like you're saying, you're never going to forget it. But we want that to be quick and we want to cover a lot of information. And then we also want to empower you to customize it. So with Picmonic, you can add content to actual Picmonics themselves. You can add facts, you can add characters, you can add notes and images, and 
you have an immense, an, an immense ability to customize the individual topics or personalize them so that if you need to know something a little bit different than we have available for you, you can tweak it. That's pretty cool. That sounds like a lot of fun. And the diversification that it allows and customization, making it more personal is obviously going to help each student's memory on that topic. It just might take a little more time initially to create it, but now you're making it personal. Now you're making it more memorable. Absolutely. I like it. I like it. Are there any common mistakes or pitfalls that you see with students using these types of materials or trying to create their own mnemonics? That's a great question. And, you know, I would say that since we opened up the Picmonic generator over the last few years and we've made it, you know, just generally accessible. And yes, you can create content for free, share it for free, consume it for free. There's just been an immense amount of content created. I mean, we're talking 20, you know, if Picmonic is created around 2000 videos, the general public has created 10 times that, right? Over 20,000. So we've, we, I haven't even seen every single one of them. And there are a lot that, uh, a lot of little things that I'd say people don't do correctly. But again, if you're creating this for yourself and you go through the active process of doing so, you're going to have better memory retention for that topic than someone else who's consuming it. But one thing I would say is chunking and grouping becomes very important. You know, if I've got a set of symptoms versus the mechanism of action versus indications, whatever those things are, chunking and grouping is very helpful to put them even in the same spatial location within the image. The flow from one character to the next, again, having this interaction that ties to some sort of storyline is very important. There's lots of little things that people can do once they've honed in on how to make these. But it's really, uh, it's supposed to be a creative journey. And I think that's part of the fun. So, you know, hard to put strict guidelines around creating cartoons for (laughs) educational topics. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good to hear. I I know there's a lot of little tweaks I hear from from more of the training point of view sometimes if they have students that they personally train. But when they're switching like the words, trying to create a mnemonic when they're just getting started, have a lot of difficulty finding words that'll match or just kind of finding the basic process to how to make a visual out of medical terminology, especially with every discipline basically having its own vocabulary and its own language. It can definitely be a barrier to entry if you're especially new to these techniques. But even if you're not, just the new terminology is quite difficult at first to uh, to start transitioning into visual mnemonics. It can be very overwhelming. And I think it's one of those that's, again, we've lost in education more and more of the creativity and the fun and the colorful, spirited nature of it. You know, what we learned is in preschool and first grade was typically a lot more fun and imaginative. The older we get, the drier and more boring it can become. <laughs> and so it's hard. I think a lot of us as adults, we've lost that that imagination and and to kind of re-spark that and invigorate it in learning is is difficult. It's difficult for individuals and and, and I think difficult for companies, but uh, but it can be done. And if done well, it can be incredibly powerful. Agreed. I suggest watching more cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as we get closer to the end of the episode here, I generally like to end it with three questions. And uh, this new segment that's been recently added in is called Just Three Wishes. So how about we go with the first question? I'm scared. <laughs> what do you got for me? Come on, bring it up. All right. So they can be as general or detailed as you like. It's just sort of personal opinion. But the first one is, if there's anything you wish you could remember better, what would it be? My childhood memories. Hmm. Good one. Anything in particular or just in general? I would just say in general, I think too often people ask me about, or maybe it doesn't happen often, but when I get asked about certain things in my earliest of days, I just, I remember very little of it. Hmm. So I wish I had a better memory in general, but uh, that's where I would be. Ditto. <laughs> um, all right. So that could be an interesting thing to discuss with like family and pull out the old, uh, videos and pictures and (laughs) I might just be embarrassed at that point. Yeah. Go down the whole memory lane. The second question, if there's anything you wish that you could change in education, what would it be? That it was free. Oh, good one. I think it should be free. I don't think from a business perspective, that's always going to be realistic, but uh, 
I think cost prohibits a lot of great people from having a, a, a fantastic education. And I just wish we could make education free. I couldn't agree more. I don't understand how we can have these uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses going on for years and years and years and not just make that accreditation maybe worth a little something more. Have you ever used edX or Coursera.com or anything like that? Really? I think they're phenomenal platforms. Yeah. Take some of the best professors or educators in the world and videotape them and put them on a platform and make that available to the masses. It's, it seems like a no brainer, but, uh, I think there's a lot of politics involved in education and it's a conservative industry to change. And yet I'm still elated that, you know, companies like Picmonic and Sketchy have become mainstay in healthcare education. And I think it's, it's fantastic and is evidence that, uh, you know, if you take something and if enough people have a problem and you solve it in a creative way and the market adopts it, then it might not be the uh, top dogs who really get to make the final say on what's used and what's not used. Couldn't agree more. And having the online platform, so it's widely accessible, best way to go about it. And the third question is very similar, but if there's one thing you could change in medicine, what would it be? These are tough questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, and so, you know, I've stepped out of medicine largely as I'm now in education technology, but we're incredibly focused on healthcare. And I think that instead of maybe going down a, towards a negative answer, I think I'd take it more towards the positive with the change of what I believe the future beholds for medicine. And I'm really excited about the the potential of technology nanotechnology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics. I think that our ability in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years to accurately diagnose and treat patients with any or every illness is going to be significantly more robust and, and impressive than it is today. So I think that the positive change in, in uh, medicine that I'm excited for is, is the advancements with just so much that's on the forefront that technology has enabled robotics, et cetera. Yeah. Medical advancements every few years, it's kind of like cell phone technology. You can't imagine it because it's so gradual, but look back five, 10 years and imagine what's going to be here in five, 10 years from now. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. So are there any other resources that you would recommend for students, whether it be educational, self-assessment, anything like that? You know, I don't want to be biased in my answer to this question. I think there are a lot of phenomenal tools out there and students need to, to evaluate them and see really what works for them. So not, not going to shamelessly plug Picmonic. You know, I think we have a great resource. I think Sketchy's great. I think the use of visual mnemonic tools is, is and should be a standard at this point in medical education. Beyond that, everybody knows that they're going to need first aid. As far as question banks, you know, Kaplan U World, USMLE RX, et cetera. I think that other tools such as Pathoma is phenomenal. I think Osmosis is, is an, and I'm blown away at how much their platform and content has evolved over the last five years. Uh, I think that the founders, Shiv and, and Ryan, have just done a phenomenal job. Online MedEd and some of the, the videos that they're creating, especially even for more kind of step two content and internal med, it's, it's great product. There's just so many tools and resources that have come into the market since I've left medical school. So I'm not even the best, uh, I wouldn't say, authority on making recommendations. I would say, listen to the, listen to the students, listen to the academics, do your research dig in early. Just don't get too overwhelmed by what's available to you. And then pick them, stick with them, and especially use tools that have spaced repetition so that it's following you along your journey. You're going to need to know, you know what you learned your first year into second, third, fourth, and beyond. So That's a very good point. There's so many materials out there, but I would recommend the audience that uh, probably knows already how many of those topics and individuals we've had on this show, but also the main Inside the Boards podcast does interviews with a lot of the other educators in in current medical training and medical education. So we get a unique view of just how rapidly some of these things are evolving. And it's it's pretty cool. It's insane, but really fun to be a part of and watch and talk to all of the big players in this current medical educational revolution. I love it. Any parting thoughts or recommendations? No, I think the you know, in general, first and foremost, appreciate you taking time to chat with us today and to, to enable Picmonic to share a little bit more about our journey and story. 
and for those who are listening, you know, just recognize it's not an it's not an easy journey to get into medical school or a healthcare profession to get through the first couple of years to pass the boards to go on to you know clinicals or residency and beyond and become a competent healthcare provider the journey is is difficult but uh you can do it so keep your head up find that balance and use big monic <laughs> <laughs> Great parting words. Well, thank you so much, Ron Robertson, CEO of Picmonic. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Jay, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, man. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you. So please send an email or join us on the Medical Anemonist Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated.